लाइटनिंग हिल आई एम अ बैचलर विद अ बिग हाउस एंड आई लिव अप इन द हिल्स सो आई एम वेरी पॉपुलर विद फ्रेंड्स एंड रिलेटिव especially in the summer mm in the winter i've noticed my popularity tends to wane lest you think i'm the kindest hearted person i should tell you i have my own system of payment stories i tell stories and tall tales and you never know which is which still you have to listen or the generosity pipeline runs dry When I've had enough of my visitors, I retire upstairs to my personal quarters where no guest may venture. But I range downstairs at my will. And when I'm in the mood for a story, you need to be in one too. A distant nephew, or more correctly, nephew of a nephew, had booked a 5-day slot in the summer calendar. He brought with him a sweet young wife. Their holiday interlude was half done when a thunderstorm threatened. Lightning zigzagged over the hills and thunder rolled over us in a wide arc, gaining and then losing volume as it roared away into the distance. The outdoors were dense and dark and there was a dangerous sizzle in the air. Far away to the right A fierce orange flame exploded on a hillside. The thunder that followed was an almighty crack, as if the world was splitting in two. The girl leapt out of her chair to peer out the window. The whole hill was on fire, or enough of it to make no difference. Lightning hill, I nodded knowingly. She shivered slightly. I still fixed on the blaze. Does lightning always strike it? Indeed it does, I assured her. We are safe on these hills, but if you build so little as a haystack or so much as a mansion on that hill, it won't survive. You can cover it in a forest of lightning conductors, but come the first electric storm of the season, it will be in flames. Many have believed that there must be a solution and they are clever enough to find it. And maybe there is. But in the decades I've been here, it hasn't been found. That hill does not intend to be conquered. It will tolerate sheep and tea. But when humans try to tame it, it fights back and shows who's boss. Oh, go on, Grandpa. They both called me that, though I wasn't Grandpa to either of them. Go on, Grandpa. You don't really believe that, surely you don't. They harangued me. Aha. Uh-huh. So you're skeptics. You don't believe that hills and clouds and rivers have souls that must be propitiated. That's all very well for you city kids, but up here in the mountains. things are more elemental and there's a great deal that science can't explain like what countered the nephew come on lay it on us and we'll see what we can't explain i don't take challenges like that lightly you will go there tomorrow when the sun is setting and experience it for yourself but i'll tell you the story today so that you can do your darndest to resist Then we'll know about your science and its answers. There's a big black shell of a house on that hill. It was home to a wealthy family. That hill and a few others belong to them. They'd always lived on another hill and used this one only for growing tea or grazing. So though the lightning hits were regular and dependable, they did no major harm. There are only a few burnt out ruins on the hill, small shelters of wood or stone abandoned when lightning took its toll. The brothers had a falling out 
and the younger one decided to build a house on Lightning Hill and live there with his wife and three daughters. He well knew the awesome reputation of that hill, but he was a progressive man, a man of science, and was confident he would defeat it. A grand home was built with multiple levels of lightning security. Until the first storm, there was much tension. But the house handled it without a scorch. And science and technology had saved the day. The nephew and his wife looked triumphant. But the story wasn't ended yet. It was a traditional family. And younger brother was authoritarian in all matters, especially regarding his daughters. The two elder girls were meek and dutiful and obeyed Papaji's wishes and life was rosy. But the youngest daughter, Bijli, had always been a rebel and strained at the yoke. Her limbs were smooth and supple like a young deer, her voice a bubbling stream full of liquid energy. Everyone loved her, for she had a ready smile and a kind heart. When she informed her father that she was in love with a boy from the village and wanted to marry him, the whole countryside trembled for her. For sound travels well in the upper reaches and the roars that emanated from Papaji reverberated across the hills. But Bijli was a chip of the old block. If he did approve of her choice, she declared, he would watch her die an old maid, for she'd certainly not marry any other. Papaji imprisoned her in the house forthwith and commanded his wife and other daughters to make her see sense. His sense, that was. Young Bijli had only one weapon the most extreme passive weapon in the world and she deployed it immediately. She stopped eating. Her mother and sisters beseeched her. Papaji was headstrong. He would never give in. She was young. She would soon forget this fellow, whoever he was. Such stubbornness was unwarranted. After all, Papaji wanted what was best for her, didn't he? But Bijli was equally headstrong. She clamped her mouth shut. No words out, no food in. In four days, she was terribly weak. In five, she could no longer rise from her bed. In a week, she couldn't even sit up or open her eyes and was but a rack of her former self. Her mother and sisters now desperately pleaded with Papaji they dragged him to her room and he was so horrified by her appearance that he capitulated immediately. The relationship was doomed from the start. He was undereducated and poor. Circumstances which can change and ideally shouldn't matter. But he was also dull and boring and had nothing to commend himself except his half-crazed devotion to Bijli. So lackluster was he that history hasn't even recorded his name. She was charming and intelligent and the most well-known personality in the hills. How could their love have endured such inequality? But Papaji's violent opposition had so got her back up that though he was right, there was now no respectful retreat for Bijli. She got her strength back and returned to normal life. One day, during a sudden summer squall, it was noticed Bijli hadn't yet returned. Worrisome, but not overmuch. It had happened before to all of them. She'd take shelter wherever she was and call when the electricity and telephone lines were restored. It's never good to be out during an electric storm, for in the expanse of the mountains, the lightning and thunder rage wicked and willful. The nephew and wife were now silent. 
The wild flashes and rolls outside the windows gave credence to my remarks. And from the warmth and safety of their own relationship, they were sucked into worry about this ill-fated romance. The power came back and the telephone sprung to life. But there was no reassuring call from Bijli or any neighbor to say she was safe, don't worry. And Papaji worried and couldn't be convinced to exercise patience. He called together his staff and went looking for her. Eminently impractical, since no one knew where to look in the first place. And surely she was safe and sheltering somewhere. He sent word through the community that Bijli was missing and dozens turned up to help. It was Papaji who found them. Curled together in the futile shelter of one of those burnt-out dwellings, in the eternal embrace of death. They wouldn't even have known what hit them, and death would have been instantaneous and merciful, for it united them forever, whereas life might well have separated them. It destroyed the family. This charming child had been the light of all their lives, They left their home in the hills and went away and never came back. The house stood tall and proud, but no one wanted anything to do with it, for there was a veil of doom over it. In the next stormy season, lightning struck repeatedly and mercilessly, igniting many fires. At the end of that period, the house was a blackened shell with blasted walls. And that's how it remains to this day. During the day, the shepherds and tea workers reclaim the hill. But as the sun sets, the slopes are deserted. It is reported that Bijli and her young man range freely over the hill, chasing each other and rejoicing in the eternal freshness of their romance. They don't like old men, so I've never visited after sunset but they bless young lovers. Their laughter and their running footsteps are heard, now here, now there, joyfully tripping over the hill. The air is soft and sweet with the perfume of their undying devotion. Sometimes they show themselves. She always has a circlet of wild flowers in her hair. They remain eternally young, their love never waning, their pleasure in each other undiminished by time. The two young ones were huddled together. They didn't want to believe, but had got pulled into the story. I'd seen the horror in their eyes when I spoke of the couple being discovered together. The hope when I spoke of their continued presence on the hill. I pulled my old bones out of my favourite chair. I suggest you take yourselves off there tomorrow, after sunset, and see for yourselves. I'm eager for verification of this old story, and you too, doubters, will be my best chance. For I'm sure they will reveal themselves to you. We can discuss it over dinner. Now, it's been a long day, and unlike you young ones, I need my rest. So you'll excuse me. Good night. And sweet dreams, I quote, trundling myself off upstairs, knowing full well their dreams would be anything but sweet. Dinner, tomorrow night, will be interesting. (laughs) 